This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. New Haven resident Mohammed Hafez had a successful career as an architect for a global firm, but his calling, as he describes it, is his art. He creates miniature sculptures inspired by some of the oldest cities in the world, like Damascus in Syria, his homeland. His sculpture series pushes viewers to consider the meaning of home and the people left behind in places ravaged by war or those that flee to another country for safety. It's a crisis we're watching again, this time in Ukraine. Today, where we live, we visit Mohammed Hafez at his studio, just above one of his newest ventures, the Pistachio Cafe in the Westville neighborhood in New Haven. From the Middle Eastern treats like baklava to the smells of Syrian coffee, his cafe brings out a sense of home and nostalgia that Mohammed creates in his sculptures, too. His life is the focus of a recent documentary called A Broken House, shortlisted by the Oscars this year. We talk about that coming up and what it was like to share more about his family, who live in several different countries now. He also talks about his partner, a musician he listened to for many years before they actually met. You can join our conversation. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. I met up with Mohammed in his office above Pistachio Cafe in Westville earlier this month. It's been several years since we last spoke. It has been. And a lot has happened yeah. uh, during that time. And when we met, we were talking about your baggage series. And can you remind our listeners about that particular work and what are some of the thinking or thoughts behind the mission of that project right. and how it relates even to today? Uh, yeah, this this was... Um, a body of work done in, um, I believe, 2016, going into 2017, at the height of the um, refugee crisis in uh, Europe. And uh, right after I learned, one of my own family family members became a refugee in Sweden. So uh, this is a body of work of 10 suitcases uh, that are miniature sculptures that tell the stories of 10 different families resettled in Connecticut greater Connecticut area from all over, from Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Congo, you name it, to paint a picture of how global was the refugee crisis and um, how ignorant it was to really paint people with one wide brush stroke. So we tried to humanize uh, the refugee crisis through telling these snippets um, of multimedia sculpture. You hear they have headphones, you hear them speaking to you for 30, 40 seconds. It grabs your attention and you get to learn more about the families uh, on a placard to the side. And um, the show actually is on exhibit right now in the Fleming Museum up in uh, University of Vermont. And um, every time I put up this show, I internally kind of wish for it to kind of go away and become old news, but we're always surprised how relevant uh, the work is um, considering what is happening in the world and the Ukrainian crisis and so on. Mm. Part of uh, your goal, as you mentioned, was to confront these misperceptions that people had of refugees uh, and also um, to help display some of uh, what you felt when you heard of your uh, sister being forced uh, to leave and become a refugee. Uh, and so talk more about, you know, when you think about what is resonating with you today, when we think about what's happening in Ukraine and the fact that this message continues uh, to hold so much for people. Well, uh, there's this perception out there that refugees, at least from the Middle East, as we've learned quite recently, come from nowhere, no established lives. And they've left nothing behind, right? And they're just, they were coming here to take money and jobs, and they were uncivilized, as some have uh, outlined. So I, I used my lived experience here as a proud Syrian-American citizen to pick sound bites from their lives 
that a normal Joe would find intriguing and would find commonality with and would be intrigued to learn more about that Syrian family. You know, the fact that they've had uh, luxury belongings or crystal chandeliers in their house or they miss their French Victorian sofa, for instance. Um, how it pertains to the Ukrainian crisis, of course, it's it's very bittersweet that the work is continues to be relevant. Um, we are still seeing, you know, the refugee crisis uh, getting larger and larger. Now, one and a half million people have left the country. Um, but there's so much to unpack there. I think there's another project now that's just boiling in my head that goes around the notion of who's worthy of helping and who's not worthy of helping. How do you decide which refugee to help and who is civilized and who's not civilized? The fact that a, a conversation like that is still happening in front of our eyes um, is really something that intrigues me and something to, to really uh, think about and, and, and try to make work about. Mm -hmm. When I talked with you earlier about your baggage series, you mentioned the emotional baggage that we all carry. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about that and describe for our listeners who may not have seen this work, how you turned to modeling to deal with your own nostalgia for a right. home that you had to leave and the, the homesickness that you felt. Well. You know, as as any immigrant goes through, you're you're severely troubled. Just the nostalgia alone, the homesickness, the fact that you're unable to go to an established life that once existed, is already pain in itself. Now, thank God we were very blessed not to witness the atrocities. You know, I've 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 never seen a mortar shelf fall on 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 my family or something like that. Nonetheless, I was I was seeing all of these images on my social media feed every day, day in and day out. And as we're seeing from Ukraine now as well. So as we're sitting here in my studio, I print these photos and I put them on the wall to keep reminding myself of that pain, uh, the greater pain that the humans have endured. The pictures Mohammed references are images from the Syrian civil war. There are more than a dozen taped to the wall above his office doorway. There are faces of children and pictures of destroyed buildings. While the world's attention has moved away from Syria to Mohammed, the consequences of the war are still front and center for him. Add that my own homesickness and nostalgia, art became a therapeutic and cathartic way for me to have some therapy and healing and I did it through just spending hundreds of hours modeling these uh, intricate miniature sculptures in this narrow studio listening to my Syrian music boiling my Syrian coffee eating my baklava and so on how has your work expanded since the baggage series Mohammed so um, I continue to have a lot of baggage, <laughs> physically and metaphorically, but um, I've moved on now. It, it healed me in a sense that I find myself now back to the nostalgic phase. Um, I'm working with a lot of educational um, institutes to remodel what used to be before these crises hit for the new generations that don't know that part about their lives and their heritage. You're talking about 20 years in a refugee uh, camp. The, the average per United Nations average years is 17 years somebody s spends. So we're now facing generations that don't know much about their roots and why is it so important to have pride in, in coming from these roots. So what I'm doing today is I am focusing on remodeling with high detail, multimedia, infused with sound and s soundscapes of these cities, streetscapes that talk about Damascus, Iraq, Baghdad, Egypt, Lebanon, the way I remember it and the way my parents remember it. So tell us more about the, the projects, and I understand you have a open door policy. Describe that. Um, yes, uh, we have 
done a lot of workshops with so many schools and a um, f- few museums as well. And um, as it pertains to the open door policy, it's, you know, I share my story and I share my technique. And some of the workshops, um, we invite these students to uh, sculpt their own feelings and memories of home. And so in that sense, they partake in this methodology of making art and it makes them discover the common denominator between them and their fellow students. That's on one side. But on the other side, um, we're working with a lot of institutes that open their archive doors to, to me as a Syrian uh, Muslim uh, American ar- artist that said, listen, we have hundreds of thousands of objects from your region. Would you like to take a look? So uh, that became extremely uh, interesting for me as well. We're going to play some audio from some of the students that you've worked with. My piece is wrapped with a blanket that represents the safetyness of home. Home isn't just one place for me. Home is really a combination of many things because not one house simply represents home for me because I've moved so many times and have lived in so many different places. So I was like starting to build how what my old home looked like back in my country, Yemen. And then throughout the process, I was kind of like building it up and it started looking like what my home looked like. But then I remembered that throughout the war, I left my home and now I was thinking to picture how it would look like after the war, how it would look like now. Home is where the dog barks. Home is where there's the smell of good food cooking where the sofa sits and we all sit on it together. That is really the essence of home. Tell us more about how those recordings will feature into the project, Mohammed. Well, for a long time and coming from higher uh, uh, social positions from leaders, there was this effort to say that diversity is not good for societies, right? That uh, differences uh, um, are what we use to differentiate between us and build walls between cultures, and they belong there and we belong here. And at the crux of this project, if you look at each piece individually and each sound, it won't make much sense. But if you look at this tapestry that is a collective of a diverse uh, group of sounds and testimonies and and lives, you see richness, you see beauty, you see a celebration of diversity uh, that you hear through these stories. And very fast, you recognize a common denominator between us and our fellow human beings, right? And so this is the America that I signed up for. Muhammad's computer fittingly kicked in under this important sentiment, issuing a call to prayer reminder. He quickly picked back up. So when you stand in front of these uh, workshop, the final outcome, you're standing in front of a 20 foot wide tapestry of many sculptures that the students have, uh, have built. And it talks about someone's emotional uh, baggage being uh, caused by a divorce in the family as opposed to somebody that have left home because of a hurricane as opposed to somebody that have left because of economic reasons as opposed to somebody that have left uh, because of wars you know and very soon do we we notice these the common uh, side effects uh, and the common aftermath in human beings when we have to up root ourselves from our homes and it's through building that common denominator that I try to build empathy and shared understanding and appreciation of what people have gone through you know earlier uh, on the show we've talked about the renovations that are underway at the Peabody Museum and how they're working to update the curatorial voice there, but it also means involving the community. Are you involved in that process? I am. I'll, uh, I'll tell you um, 
A bit of a sound bite uh, about a project in the works. Um, nothing has been solidified yet, but we've been um, uh, talking about utilizing the huge arsenal of archaeological objects in the Peabody Museum in ways that we can replicate them in through 3D printing technology, and I would use them in my sculptures, the replicas. <laughs> um, and in that sense, what used to be a, a Mesopotamian bowl could become a church's dome or a mosque minaret and so on. So there's a, a finder's game that the students can then, as walking through this show, can learn about these objects. And through studying the legends on the side, you can go and find, oh, where's this 3,000-year-old object that I'm looking for, right? So through building this huge tapestry, you're not only teaching uh, the visitors about the archaeological and architectural wealth of these cities, but you're also experiencing the sound of these cities, the bustling life, the call to prayers, the church bells, uh, the merchants in the street, the pigeons. And in my mind, that alone is a testimony of coexistence and diversity in its own right that have existed for centuries unlike the perception that is being drafted in news outlets today our listeners can't see the, the huge smile on your face the spark in your eye when i asked you about this project this is what makes you excited this is your passion i think this is my calling i think um I found what would make me feel good at my uh, deathbed, not to put uh, things in a gloomy, but um, as as a you know a Muslim, as a as a, a spiritual person, you want to leave something behind that keeps on giving, a gift that keeps on giving. I don't have millions of dollars, but I have the skill at hand. It has served me well to deal with my own nostalgia, but I think its place is to really reignite the nostalgia in millions of children and students that have not experienced in person the love that I've seen in these cities. Um, it is magical. Now, anybody that's been to our region, they would, they would agree with me. They would say, yes, I, I can't you know, uh, forget my time in Beirut and in Damascus before all of this mess happened. So art and miniature and realistic miniature uh, gives our imagination a way to dive into these scenes. And for a split second, you really forget that you're looking at a sculpture and you're completely immersed in the scene. Meanwhile, you're an accomplished architect. Can you talk more about um, when we're even in the space that we're sitting in, where you create? Um, describe for us the objects on the wall and, and how this all leads into your creativity. Well, for, for almost uh, a decade, as I worked in this you know, fast-paced uh, field of architecture, I've enjoyed it very much, and I've, I've really uh, learned so much from it. But I've also was troubled uh, th through my own personal uh, problems at home and the witnessing of the wars and crises and seeing these millennia-old cities being bombed out of existence. So my own um, sanctuary was the studio, which is a tall, narrow space. Uh, filled with photos of, of Damascus and, and uh, the Levant in general. And then I have a water fountain. I have uh, incense that I burn here. And I boil a lot of Syrian coffee to fill the air with cardamom smell so I can be back at my mom's kitchen again. I listen to Syrian and uh, Spanish Sufi music. Um, and before you know it, I click into this... Uh, creative cloud and when I click I'm no longer in New Haven Connecticut I, I I lose track of time I can easily pull 10 hours straight here without noticing 
And so for many, many years, I've lived this dual life, uh, a corporate architect in daytime, a nighttime artist that is really just offloading um, this emotional baggage. And I've been very blessed to have a skill to put that emotion into an outcome. Because if you don't, you would probably easily go into depression, right? So if I tell, I tell people if I had a 3D printer that would print, is able to print our emotions, my 3D printer would be making these sculptures rather. It's hmm. really lovely. Can you describe one of the sculptures that you have hanging here, Muhammad? So this piece here is, um, it, it combines the French Victorian um uh, era that I, I grew up in uh, witnessing the beautiful furniture that my mom collected and you know you'll see this downstairs in pistachio um, the cultural salons that my family held uh, together um, and bringing people together with over a lot of food and a lot of coffee and uh, you have the overlapping architecture uh, with so many neighbors next to you, so many uh, things that are happening outside. You just open your window and you're witnessing this celebration of 10 million things that are happening outside. The soundscape of, of these cities alone is a, a phenomenal celebration of coexistence. So I try to collect all of that and put it in one piece. You're hearing architect and artist Mohammed Hafez. These are the sounds he recorded on his last visit to Syria in 2011, a call to prayer ringing through Damascus amid the hushed bustle of birds. We talked to him recently at Pistachio Cafe, his coffee shop and bakery. Mohammed's intricate sculptures inside suitcases evoke the, quote, baggage of Syrians fleeing the war. That series and his family's personal story were the focus of a documentary, A Broken House, shortlisted by the Oscars this year. After the break, we'll talk more about that documentary and learn how his family is doing today. This is Where We Live. This is Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. In the recent documentary, A Broken House, New Haven resident Mohammed Hafez takes you inside his workshop, a narrow office space above a coffee shop he owns in the Westville neighborhood. His artwork is haunting, miniature models of an old Damascus neighborhood, designed from his memories and his interpretation of what war leaves behind, bombed and broken homes from the Syrian civil war that started more than a decade ago. His parents and sister were refugees, and the way America and others view foreigners who flee stood out to Muhammad. His artwork, like the Baggage series, also confronts misperceptions of refugees. I sat down with Muhammad in New Haven earlier this month. One of the reasons we wanted to meet up with you again, Muhammad, is because you were the subject of a film uh, shortlisted for the Oscars uh, in the documentary short category called A Broken House, uh, directed by Jimmy Goldblum. And he really focused on your artistic process. And I'm wondering you know, how your life has changed by being so open about uh, what you miss from your homeland, but also you know, how you have moved forward uh, in your art uh, to communicate um, what uh, immigrants and refugees feel, but also, as you told us uh, in our past conversation, to talk about our common humanity. Well, for 12 years, I did not share anything. For 12 years, everything was secret, everything was confidential. Because like any human, you don't want to put your baggage out there. It's not until I saw with my own eyes, my own flesh and, and family members, in a refugee situation, right? That's when it hits you hard. That's when you learn that everything we live, everything we have, we take for granted, and it could change in a split second. These are family members that came from very established lives, very successful lives. You could never imagine anything like this happening to them. So I decided to start talking about my family and 
building that common denominator with the normal Joe out there in order to sort of build an understanding of what people leave behind. And I went through a process of embracing vulnerability with that. And once I was okay with that, and I think Jimmy grabbed me at a, at a very uh, sensitive point in my life where I couldn't care if, if it's, uh, you know, a, a crew of 10 people or 1,000 people behind me. I was just doing myself. I was, I'm going to do myself. I'm going to do my art. I'm going to do what makes me feel good. And so we were blessed and lucky to, to, to have this very genuine feeling come through the, the, the documentary and including some really intimate moments with my mom telling her a lot of things that I've been meaning to tell her. You see now the, the aftermath in, inside families, not only on our lives, but what happens inside families. Now we're talking about Ukrainians, men staying in the country, wives and, and sons leaving outside. Who knows if that family is going to reunite ever, right? And what happens if they reunite and so on. How do you tell these stories artistically? How do you tell that my family or the Syrian family or Iraqi family is worthy of the attention like any other human? Mm -hmm. Through this artwork, through this film, I think a lot of people started understanding what we've been suffering, especially now that we've all been locked up during COVID missing out on family's events, missing out on family dinners, on weddings, on funerals. It gave them a taste of what I had to go through for 10 years here. What was your family's reaction when we talk about those very intimate moments? Let's let's talk about one specifically where you and your mother are talking. And I think during the film, she had moved back uh, to Damascus. Uh, you say to her, everyone is in a different country that is not right. You all went too far. You're in Syria. My siblings are in Chicago, Dubai, Sweden. Enough. We need a solution. And then she replies, God willing. Tell us about that moment. Yeah, my mom's uh, <laughs> reaction to anything that she doesn't want to deep into is, is inshallah, God willing. Okay, we'll talk later. Okay, 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 son. And for many decades, uh, it seems that the whole family has been living under that, uh, uh, you know, all families have things that they shelf and put under the rug. Um, and my family is just like any, any other family. Uh, but I've internalized all of that. Um, I've internalized it so much that I, I missed the family being together. And we're at the point where realistically we don't think that is even possible. You know, you spend decades in all of these countries building roots. You're not going to have uh, the likeliness of, of a Thanksgiving dinner with all four siblings and all grandchildren around one table when, when they all live in five different countries. And I was just begging to, to find a solution for us to meet up together and make that a normal, you know, like any other family. Well, it turns out a lot of immigrants resonated with that scene because a lot of people saw their own moments with their mothers, with their fathers, of, you know, people just picking their paths and, and moving on. And my family and I have yet to speak about the film. So we still managed <laughs> to put that also under the rug. And where is your family today? When's the last time you've been able to see all of them? Well, the good news is the family was able to get together for the first time in Sweden because it was one of the only countries uh, welcoming Syrian passports. So that happened just before COVID. And that was uh, so heartwarming that we finally got to get a, a photo together. But we've yet to meet again um, under a single roof. Um, so, yeah, uh, now I do these visits to Dubai to see my brother and my mom. Um, I just came back, uh, you know, then you have a trip to Europe to see my sister and then a trip to Chicago to see my other sister and continue, repeat the cycle. Your heart is still in Syria, but you're not able to go back. 
Tell our listeners why. And when was the last time you were there? The last time I was there was in 2011, uh, uh, right uh, uh, at the beginning of the riots uh, in the revolution. I saw that on in TV and in person as well. Um, and I had just this nasty feeling inside that I had to document uh, what I was seeing because this might be my last time. So surely I, I walked around the city recording the voices of day-to-day life. Children playing, calls to prayer, pigeons flying in the Umayyad Mosque courtyard. People would look at me crazy like, you're not job, what are you doing? Uh, this is day-to-day, job, uh, day-to-day sounds. And um, I said, just leave me alone. And, you know, as, as history planned out, uh, it was the last time I was there, and that's the only arsenal I have of, of Syria. And that's what you hear in a lot of my multimedia pieces, is that soundscape of the cities before the war. So, yes, my heart is in it, uh, and I'm you know, equally connected to Damascus, but I'm equally uh, connected to this country as a proud American citizen uh, that is trying to build... Uh, a life for all of us to to move on and give back to the generations that are um, upcoming now. That's right. Uh, life does move on, even though your family continues to be separated in many locations. Tell us about your life moving on here in New Haven. I understand you're recently remarried. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the person that you've chosen to spend yeah. the rest of your life with? Yeah. You know, I'm a fun person. I'm not all dark and gloom. <laughs> uh, I was blessed to meet Louisa, uh, my love, the love of my life, uh, a beautiful girl from uh, Spain and a cellist uh, who happens uh, to be the cellist of my favorite Sufi music ensemble that uh, I listened to over many many years building my artwork and uh, you know God's uh, destiny does uh, funny things and just you know making you marry the cellist that you've listened to without unknowingly for, for many many years so um yeah, uh, Louisa and I have uh, so much in, in common and uh, so much uh, in contrast that, you know, kind of brings us uh, closer to, uh, to each other. Um, and I've been blessed to have, uh, you know, a, a new, uh, several new families around the world. So um, in, in that sense... Uh, life moves on. We recently uh, got, well, you know, culturally married. We're we're still waiting on her pub on her paperwork to get uh, here. But again, you know, you find yourself stuck in immigration. Uh, Twenty years ago, I was a Syrian citizen, and I got stuck here for ten years, not being able to tra- uh, to travel. Today, I'm an American citizen trying to get my beautiful uh, uh, partner here and because of COVID I'm still having to wait a year, a year and a half in line. So I think it's time we rethink our immigration system. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a whole nother show, right? It's another show. <laughs> it's interesting that you were listening to her music before you really knew her and I'm wondering now that she knows the deep appreciation you had for uh, her work, what was her reaction when she saw your artwork, Muhammad? It, it was an extremely emotional moment for her here. And, uh, you know, we weren't together at the time. I, the first time she saw the artwork, I've, I've hosted her and the ensemble here uh, when they visited New Haven. And we were talking, and I all, all I can remember is Louisa on a chair in the corner and just staring at my work with tears in her eyes uh, to you know and I I get that I think she was just really over overwhelmed and uh, taken with what she was seeing and she connected to the to the work at a deep level and we didn't speak much that day we you know so it's uh it's interesting how that uh panned out my guest is Mohammed Hafez, a New Haven artist and architect. Mohammed's wedding ceremony with Luisa Gutierrez was in January. She's a cello player in the Alfredaus Ensemble, which you're hearing now. 
After the break, we hear why Mohammed decided to become a small business owner during the pandemic when he opened Pistachio Cafe in the Westville neighborhood. And we hear his observations about the refugee crisis today out of Ukraine. This is where we live. You're listening to Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today, we're taking you into the mind of an artist. New Haven-based architect Mohammed Hafez has received international acclaim for his sculptures, like the Baggage series, reimagining the suitcases of Syrians fleeing the war. His work is currently on display in the UK and at the University of Vermont. Mohammed's artwork and his personal story are the focus of a recent documentary, A Broken House, by director Jimmy Goldblum, and shortlisted by the Oscars this year. Mohammed is also a small business owner. I'm talking with Mohammed Hafez, an architect and artist, inside his Pistachio Cafe in New Haven's Westville neighborhood. So this was a new venture that you actually opened during the pandemic, which is very brave. So tell us about the Pistachio Cafe. Well, it's um, it, it's an interesting project that came about through the shutdown of COVID. Um, I was very, very antsy to to keep working and uh, couldn't stay home, uh, you know, during the shutdown. So an opportunity came up to redesign the space downstairs and uh, working um, with my fellow friends, Luke and Misty, um, uh, who had the space uh, before as a co-working space, and to re-imagine um, it as um, a, a new hybrid use of um, a cultural salon uh, that houses, you know, brings people together. Um, because I was longing for the social life as, as, as everybody else. And the recipe that I've learned back home was always through great food, music, and baklava, and a lot of tea and coffee. So there's a, a concept in Arabia called the majlis, which is a cultural salon for uh, families, and it's a, a given specific day in the, in the month. And I, I long to that. My family, uh, my mom's family, held that many times. Um, in Damascus, they call it istibal. But I've longed for my own cultural salon where I bring people together and I have them meet each other and learn about each other, just like I've done it in the miniature form in the suitcases. And what has been the reaction from the community? It, it has been really wonderful. It's been so heartwarming. The community here in Westville is so supportive. Uh, folks have visited us from as far as New York and New Jersey and even Boston um, just to come here. We've held uh, Sufi enchantment uh, nights here. We've held jazz nights. We've held Valentine's uh, music and Broadway nights here. Um, we've held poetry nights. Um, you know, I happen to be friends with a lot of uh, uh, artists, as you could imagine. So every time there are in New Haven, we create a, a dinner time and we sit together and I invite my guests and they, they get to learn from that artist. So it's, uh, it's, it's been really heartwarming. And because it, it hit the spot inside me as an architect, uh, I learned to build bridges between people through art. But something inside me said, well, you're an architect. Could you do it in the real scale? And so it, it was meant to be, I think, to uh, eventually have something like pistachio. Describe the cafe for our listeners. Uh, when you walk in, uh, you're brought in by uh, the, the wonderful smells of the food that uh, your staff prepares, but also the colors and even the antiques on the wall. It, going into a pistachio is a small nostalgic trip into m my own uh, nostalgia to home. The minute I opened my house door in Damascus, you would smell either mom's fresh cooking or mom's Syrian coffee with the cardamom. And that's what we do downstairs. We have a lot of Syrian coffee, a lot of cardamom, and a lot of baking that is happening uh, at the same time. Um, I even... Um, kind of intend baking during business hours so that 
I want to walk into the the store and smell these goodies. Um, the decor is very Victorian, eclectic French uh, Baroque uh, that mimics my mom's salon. Um, there's old antiques and old radios that mimics my father's collection. And there are so many moments with crystal chandeliers and so on where you invite people to slow down, put down the electronics, and... Um, have a have a conversation that's interesting that you have that that division within the cafe and people respond to that they they keep their devices off yes you you cannot have a laptop open in half of the <laughs> coffee shop because it's our dining and uh you know and we heavily police it uh we want people to enjoy the uh, atmosphere to talk to each other not stare at screens uh Perhaps part of it is is my own baggage, uh, trying to connect with my own family. Uh, So you're trying to tell people like, look, don't miss out on this. Don't take it for granted. You don't know when you will be apart. And this might be, you know, a good moment to chat and just enjoy the minute. It's similar to your artwork where you use these objects to tell a story. There are objects on the wall that are part of local residents, their families, their stories. Can you share a couple of those anecdotes with us? Sure. So we have a huge collection of radios. That was the lifetime collection um, of Tony, uh, who uh, I bought his collection for 35 years uh, in Naugatuck, uh, Connecticut. And um, he was a lovely gentleman that was downsizing uh, due to the recent passing away of his wife. And he wanted to sell his babies, right? And he was worried about these going to, you know, wrong places or thrift stores and whatnot. Um, So I wanted to highlight these local uh, artisans and collectors. I I think I might have seen my father in him a little bit as well. and to tell his story and to tell his pride in these objects and how well they were put together and built, his infatuation with, with design uh, and the pride. He's, he's probably in his 80s. And, and the pride of how we built things here in the United States and how we went about uh, American-made products and, and good design. And that resonates with me as well, big time. So between that and the furniture, uh, there are so many stories and anecdotes uh, that highlight people in our own backyards. It does have the feel that we're coming into your home, Mohammed. That's the exact feeling I want you to have a bit because, you know, hospitality is really embedded in the Arab culture. Um, And we have to stuff you with a lot of food and Syrian baklava and (laughs) coffee. Uh, And we built, you know, this is the way I've known it for many years. And uh, there's no other way I know it uh, other than opening my doors and my heart to folks um, and especially hopefully outside my echo chamber somebody that might have a spicy opinion about Arabs and Syrians let alone refugees and immigrants so I invite them to come have a taste of uh, pistachio to come have a taste of my home to learn about us um, a little bit more and uh, I promise they wouldn't be disappointed. Mm. You know, getting back to uh, your art and what you hope uh, the message that people receive uh, about misperceptions, about immigrants, also refugees, you know, thinking and looking at some of the the coverage of what's happening in Ukraine, uh, news anchors who are saying uh, ignorant things about right. refugees, even from Ukraine. Now the unthinkable has happened to them. And this is not a developing third world nation. This is Europe. This isn't a place, with all due respect, um, you know, like Iraq or Afghanistan that has seen conflict raging for decades. You know, this is a relatively civilized, uh, relatively European, I have to choose those words carefully too, uh, city where you wouldn't expect that or hope that it's going to happen. What has been your reaction to the narrative you're hearing uh, about refugees fleeing Ukraine? Well, part of it, uh, I was surprised, but not that surprised, actually, because I think through my artwork, I've learned that there is a 
um, we're all programmed subconsciously to think that crises are over there, not here. That it happens to people not like us. We're different. I'll be honest, you know, uh, it's the human condition, you know, up until uh, a motor fell uh, 100 feet from my own parents' house, uh, things have hit reality at a very different level. However, when we're talking about uh, xenophobia and, and racism and differentiating between refugees and who's w worthy of helping and who's not, I, I think that's just a symptom of uh, a deeper problem uh, that as an artist I started tackling through artwork and I'm still interested in tackling. I don't get defensive with this. I, I really honestly understand how people think like that. I don't approve of it, but it, it doesn't make me angry. It makes me very energetic to make artwork that brings people together, that teach them ever so gently about that other that they fear, about that other refugee that they think is uncivilized, right? And there's nothing better than sharing humanity, sharing stories, um, sharing anecdotes about our lives. Because, you know, that's, that's the, the human connection amongst all of us. I was asking myself earlier today if people would have the same reactions to folks fleeing wars as opposed to people in our own country here fleeing their homes due to natural disasters or due to shortage of energy and, and, and food and so on or our own backyards uh, talk about life uh, talk about black lives matter would we have the same empathy as as those photos that we are seeing out of ukraine and why is that why would the world not move when they see a starving African kid? Why would they not move when they see thousands of people lost their homes due to a natural fire? And everybody's yelling, this is cli you know, climate change. That, as an artist, is a very intriguing question. I don't have the answer to it, but I'm very intrigued to tackle it in my work a preview of things to come yes <laughs> you know, again this war in ukraine uh, caused by russia invading is front and center but when we think about how the world's attention at one time was on syria and it's no longer there and i'm wondering you know how that makes you feel that you know the the world oftentimes even the united states we move on from particular conflicts although people are still left behind and are still suffering that's true um i am following the Ukra ukrainian crisis just as much as i followed the syrian crisis i think part of it is bringing out a lot of baggage from the syrian crisis and, and a lot of uh syrians and a lot of refugees and so on um the, we live in a short span world, right? We live in what's happening now. We live in the TikTok world, right? Give me your attention for three seconds and swipe away. So just like people swiped away from the lives of Syrian and Iraqi refugees, unfortunately, uh, this will continue to happen because that's a, I think that's the human condition. Now, aside from politicians and big mouths and loud mouths, I feel the artists, the creatives in societies, they really have that responsibility and the skill to connect people and to bring people together and to keep highlighting their needs and their stories. Whether you're a storyteller, whether you're you know, an artist or a sculptor, we have that ability because it is... Uh, such a powerful tool that can reach as far right and as far left in a very divided time. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Katie Pellico produced today's show. You can see images of Mohammed Hafez's artworks at our website, ctpublic.org slash where we live.